open to Psalm 66 and read the first four verses together. Psalm 66, verse 1. The psalmist says, Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, How awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we just want to sing out the honor of your name, Lord. We want the earth to rejoice, just to sing about the marvelous works and deeds that you have done. Lord, you've created us, you brought us together, and you've given us a chance to be reunited and have fellowship with you, Lord, in spite of all of our failings and missteps. Lord, you've given us the opportunity to become your children. Lord, we thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's that rock that we stand on this morning, Lord. It's that that we rely on, Lord, we just rest on you and your finished work. Lord, we just thank you for bringing us together safely this morning. Lord, there are so many who don't have the freedom to gather freely and just worship you, Father. And Lord, we should be so grateful, so joyous, and just so thrilled with praise we can come together and have this time of fellowship and worship. Lord, I pray that all our hearts be focused on you, that our minds would be focused on you alone. Lord, I thank you for those that you have raised up to share your musical gifts and leading us during this time of worship. I pray that we would be prepared to hear the message. Lord, that you would be honored and glorified throughout. Just lead us now, Lord. Direct our worship and let it be all about you. Thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's sing out. Yeah. 
pray, pray, we, we pray your blessing over this time, Lord, and that you would stir our hearts, Lord, and stir our minds for the things that you would have us take away from this time today. Lord, we just pray over the speakers today that, uh, that, that they share with us, Lord, that we be uh, just given space and, and in our ears and in our hearts, Lord, to stir us and move us and direct us and guide us, Lord, according to your will. Lord, would you give us safe passage this day? And we pray this in the glorious and victorious and all-sufficient name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, who reigns forever, Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell them good morning. going to, uh, uh, as you know, last week we finished up 2 Timothy. We're going to start uh, Titus next week, but uh, we're going to take a break this Sunday from our normal verse by verse study, uh, and I'm excited as to why. Um, here at the church, as Michael mentioned, we do support a number of ministries, uh, missions, outreach, that kind of thing. One of the ministries we're very, very thankful to be able to be part of, uh, at this point, even just financially and hopefully even more in the future, uh, is uh, Servants for Him down in Guatemala in Antigua. And uh, uh, a lot of you are already aware that Tara's parents, uh, Barry and Kita, have gone full-time with uh, Servants for Him recently. They've been with the ministry for a number of years with Forrest and Carol Kendall, who are with us this morning. And uh, Servants for Him is one of those ministries that I won't take up a lot of time talking about and take away from what Forrest wants to share with us and, and Carol. But I do want to say that one of the things that, uh, when we do support a ministry here at the church, uh, one of the things that I personally... Uh, find of tremendous value is when a ministry can find that balance between meeting practical needs and also not missing the most vital spiritual need. And Service for Him is one of those ministries that does that very, very well. Uh, they do go in and they do meet a lot of practical needs, and I'm sure Forrest will share some of this. But they also don't overlook the very important spiritual need, that which we need most in knowing Christ. And so their ministry is exactly that. It's a desire to meet the practical need with the ultimate desire to bring the gospel. And so we're very thankful to be part of their ministry. And I'd like to invite Forrest and Carol up to share with us this morning. Welcome, guys. We have three generations of us here, well, really four, I guess, with the baby and Tara and Justin and Keita and, and Barry and now us. Uh, we really appreciate that you care about missions and you care about hearing the word of God spread to the ends of the earth. And although Antigua may not be the ends of the earth, it seems like it's <laughs> So we appreciate your prayers and your support uh, that come with it. Go ahead. <laughs> You can see we have this plan. <laughs> um, Servants for Him, was, we've been in Guatemala for about 10 years, going on 11. Um, we started out as a um, appropriate technology ministry where we did stoves and water filters and built houses for widows. Our, um, nearly all of the water in Guatemala is contaminated, and uh, we had the highest infant mortality rate in all of Latin America. Um, and we thought that we could help um, with some of those problems by bringing them clean water and the hope of Jesus Christ. So we started off with water filters, and 
the little line that goes with it is, God stuck in your water, makes you sick, kills your babies. They know that. Raise your hands, it's a water filter. It cleans the water and makes you healthy. And at the same time, we were always saying, there's bad stuff in your life, we call it? Sin. Do we have an answer for that? Jesus. Jesus. He cleans your life and gives you living water. Hundreds and hundreds of people have come to know Christ because the water filter ministry. It's simple, it's easy. Once they see that the water makes a change in their life, they believe that Jesus Christ made a change in their life. And um, so that's how we got started. Um, but the more time I spent inside people's houses, Forrest got to build water filters outside, I got to spend time inside. Um, they cook on the ground inside their house over an open flame fire. And with that fire is a lot of smoke and with that smoke is a lot of eye damage and respiratory damage and burns. We see, we see horrific burns from the fires. And so I'm going, Forrest, we need to do something about stoves. And so we started uh, building a, um, it's called a pump efficient wood stove. It's a concrete box with a chimney. And so the, the smoke um, isn't in their home anymore. Same little thing. You know, the stove makes your life bad and kills you and damages you. And the same way that when we bring Jesus Christ in, all that sin is gone. And so people that didn't get saved with water got saved with stoves. And so, <laughs> but it, it was so easy for them to see that uh, I thought, wow, this is really fun. I could do this. I, I could really do this. And um, so we did that for a long time, except that then Forrest began to notice that. Pastors and church leaders weren't, weren't getting the idea of really serving their community. I mean, they love to have us come in and do projects, but they weren't putting their arms around the projects and doing it. And, the, and, our, and our goal was we equip the church and let them reach their communities. And we, we have a hard time speaking Spanish. A lot of the communities we work in they don't even speak Spanish, they speak a, a Mayan dialect. So, so we're not, we, we, can't, we can't adequately address a culture. And, and we thought, I mean, if you, look at, if you look at the evangelized world, Central America, it always shows up as being reached. South America, a good part of the world. And yes, they have been reached. They haven't been discipled. And, and so we started seeing this disconnect between what we were trying to accomplish for the church and, and what we expected uh, them to be doing. And we said, hey, there's, there's a problem here. And as, as we started talking with pastors more and more, seeing problems that, that were in families that had been grown up in the church, we're going, what's the problem here? And, and as, we, as we started talking with individuals in churches, started talking with pastors, there's, there's a huge disconnect between God's word and culture. And, and, we, and we see that the church, there's been a lot of evangelistic activity. There's been a lot of helps ministries, including what we were trying to do. But not a whole lot of time spent on really teaching pastors how to disciple the people out in their churches. And so we made a, a major shift in the ministry and trying to focus more on training pastors, keeping these technologies in our hip pocket, but the idea is as we start seeing pastors get really understanding the idea of serving in their communities, then they'll then they'll turn around, we hope, and say, hey, let's let's start doing some projects. Uh, so now we do a lot of discipleship training, we teach a lot of inductive Bible study classes, we teach how to do inductive Bible study. But most of all, a, the biggest change for me in the ministry in the last two years is I always thought to do inductive Bible study, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, you had to read. <coughs> and in Guatemala, we had a horrible civil war that lasted 36 years and ended in the late 90s. So during that time, all of the Mayans, all of the Mayan schools were closed. And so most people never went to school. If you never went to school, guess what you can't do? You can't read. And so as, as, I went out, I found that I couldn't teach my classes because there's no one coming in. But the saddest part about it all is they come to me and they go, um, God can't love us. I said, 
you know, I can't God love you because I because we can't be. And some missionary or some pastor or somebody told them that unless you've been reading the Bible, you can't know God. And if you don't know God, then God can't love you. Well, that's not true. And I said, we can fix that today. We can fix that today. And I can teach you the verses that you need to know to know that God loves you. And then you'll know that. And then you'll go, I mean, this was a whole new thing for me. Doris came home from this conference going, you're going to do this. It's called Oral and Young Bucks. And I'm like, not me. You haven't made me read anymore. So when I began to see the change I made in the women's lives, I could do this forever. Forget the stoves. I'm, I'm, I'm all about this now. So I go to the pastors because I'm a very subservient missionary. And I say, what do you want me to teach your women? What is the most important thing? that your fellowship needs to know at this time. And the first ones were, you know, adultery. We, we struggle with that in our country. Um, uh, we struggle with, what does it mean to walk as a believer? Uh, we struggle with uh, widows and abandoned women. So I said, could you come up with some verses for that? So I did. One of the ones I, I teach is the adulterous woman. Well, those are hard verses because at the end he says, go. It's in the word. And so, it's, I think the adulterous woman is 11 verses. But I memorize the verses. I never, never thought I would do that. I can memorize, I can memorize lots of verses now because the Spirit gives me the ability to. But these women are used to memorizing them. So, I, we can talk about the verses. They can memorize them. Then we can talk about who, what, where, when, why, how, what was going on. And then the questions. What did God teach you? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to change now? And who are you going to tell? And those are always the three most important things after every lesson is, what did God teach you? What are you going to change in your life? Who are you going to tell about? And they'll come back the next day and they'll go, I told my mother-in-law. I told my sister. We're going to stop doing this in our family now. Because now they know what God's word says. And they know it word for word, verse by verse, because that's how we teach it. Some people, when they, this, this is also called spiritual, some other people, when they do this, um, just kind of tell a story. Well, if you just kind of tell a story, what happens to the story after a while? A little thing gets changed here, a little thing gets changed there, and the whole life gets changed someplace else, and pretty soon you have a whole different story. So we teach, it for, uh, we teach it word by word, verse by verse. And we call them all stories. And since they're a storytelling culture, they think it's great, and they learn it. And when I go back a year later to some places that I haven't been before, they still know the stories. And they can still tell me who they've told, how they've changed their lives, you know, what, how God was talking to them. So that's the most exciting change in um, the last couple of years for me. Oh, I hate it when he does that to me. <laughs> hey, I mean, I mean, it's, it's been amazing what, what God what did, God did in our lives to get us Guatemala because I, I worked in technology for, for 30 plus years. And it's really old. <laughs> well, we'll talk about age in a minute. <laughs> um, but roughly 12 years ago, he just made it very obvious, you know, by taking me out of the, out of the VP position in a software company and just making it clearly obvious that, that he wanted us in Guatemala. Uh, oh, wait, you missed something. That was not we. That was that's he. That's not me. That's that was he. Uh, God doesn't always talk to two people at the same time, the same way. And I went driving. Oh, well, I, no, I went, I went willingly because I'm obedient, but I did not want to go. And I had a really bad experience with the Spanish culture when I was in this Peace Corps. And I thought, I'll never go again. You know, my personal space is about 15 feet out there. In Guatemala, it's right there, and I don't like people that close to me. And I said, well, God, could you just, you know, he can go down there and do whatever he wants and come home every once in a while, and I'll just stay? And God said, Carol, I have a need to you. And I have worked your whole life building stuff in you so that you'd be ready for this day. And I'm going, <laughs> anyway, so we'll be available after the service. You know. <laughs> Yep. It's great. I, as soon as the plane landed, I knew I was right where God was. I never wanted to go back. 
I have four children and grandchildren that I never get to see. Or I, you know, I have grandchildren I've never seen except on Facebook. I have kids that I've seen my daughter once in the last 10 years. That seems hard. But I love Jesus more. And I would go until my last day to be Carol's the passionate one in our family. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, of course, in the past. Thanks for letting us come. It's, uh, it's exciting to hear that you guys just finished studying uh, 2 Timothy. When, when Carol and I first learned how to do an inductive Bible study, we're just getting from here. Yeah, getting rid of the precepts. It was on 2 Timothy. And... Uh, but because we, you know, 30 plus years ago, we got saved in a Bible teaching church and a, and a missions minded church, and like Carol was saying, was those kinds of things that God was doing from the very beginning was uh, preparing us for what we're doing today. And, uh, but I have, I, I love Second Timothy, it's that, and you'll see why. <laughs> let's, uh, let's pray and we'll, uh, we'll take a look at a few verses in, uh, in Nehemiah chapter 8 this morning. Father, thank you for, uh, for your word, thank you for, uh, for this church. And Father, like uh, Carol said, that, uh, you know, every time we, uh, we hear your word, uh, or we read your word, your desire is for us to first know what it says, and then really listen to uh, how you're speaking to uh, each one of us personally. But it's not just for us, Lord. Uh, you want us to, uh, you know, take you. Just as we sang this morning, you know, we want everybody around us to uh, praise your name, uh, praise your name, and and give you, you know, the glory that is due you. And it's a result of knowing who you are and sharing that with other bit, uh, uh, others is when that uh, when it happens. So as pray as we uh, as we look at Nehemiah this morning, uh, you might. Uh, Encourage us, you know, stimulate us to uh, take the things that you're teaching us today and share it with somebody else. In Christ's name. In the, we're going to start in Nehemiah 8, but uh, if you back up to verse 66 through uh, and 67, and actually through, through 69 of Nehemiah chapter 7, what's happened up to this point? Israel has been not Israel, Judah, has been in captivity for 70 years. How many, in Guatemala, it's, it's okay to ask people how old they are. So is, is anybody in here 70? Don't be ashamed. <laughs> Seven, 70 or more. So, so what's happened in, in 70 years in your life? Faster cars. <laughs> Probably cars. <laughs> Flush toilets. <laughs> okay, a lot of technology changes. What else? What's happened in your family? Well, I've got a 105-year-old mother. Okay. Wow. Kids? Grandkids? Have you had any family members die in 70 years? Uh huh. Grandmother, 104. But they were in the same day. Only child. You know, a lot of a lot of stuff happens in 70 years. Now, I'm 62, so I haven't quite. I, I'm not quite there yet. But a lot has happened in, in 62 years. But if we if we look at the history of first Israel. In the, the northern ten tribes, and then and then Judah, you know the Assyrians come in and, and basically took over the, the northern ten tribes. A few years later, Babylonia comes in and takes Judah captive and takes the the smart ones, a lot of them, to modern day um, Iraq, Iran, and then we we come back at the end of those seventy years with the books of of Ezra. And Nehemiah, 
Ezra came back to the area to rebuild the temple, followed by Nehemiah to rebuild the walls around the city. But you've got a new, the, the folks that left 70 years prior are not the same ones that are coming back, or very few of them are. So you probably have several new generations that have been involved in this rebuilding effort, whether it's the temple or the walls. And we get into Nehemiah chapter 8. The wall is finished. And Ezra is there among this assembly of uh, roughly 50,000 people or more in, uh, in chapter, uh, chapter 7. 50,000 people is a lot of people. So let's look at the, we'll read verses 1 through 12. All the people gathered as one man in the square, which is in front of the water gate, and they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women, and all who could listen with understanding. That phrase is, is key in this passage. Listening with understanding or having understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, and those who could understand. And all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And as the scribe stood on a wooden podium, I don't know if you guys have a podium in here. I wonder if that's where some of these traditions started. Which they had made for the purpose. I think it's so they can see him. I'm 50,000 people. He's, he need to be elevated so they can see him. And beside him stood, I'm not even going to try to read these names, but 12 or 13 guys that are standing on Ezra's left and right. And Ezra opened the book in sight of all the people, and he was standing above the people when he opened it. And all the people stood up. How many of you have been in churches where you stand when you read God's word? Maybe that tradition started here as well. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. How many guys lift, lift up your hands when you're singing or when you're hearing God's word? It's okay. <laughs> <clears throat> and they bowed and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And, and then another list of names. Um, it says that these, these men explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. And they read from the book of the law of the Lord, the law of God, the translating to give sense so that they understood the reading. Then Nehemiah, who was governor, and Ezra, the priest, and scribe, and Levites, who taught the people, all said to the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. And he said to them, Go. Eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. We'll finish, we'll, uh, finish right there. We, we see that, the whole idea in verse 12 again. Of, uh, well, in verse 12, verses 11 and 12 are good, so we'll read those as well. So the Levites calm all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went away to eat, to drink, to sense portions to celebrate the great festival because they understood the words which had been made known to them. You know, this passage says that they, they heard God's word and their response was crying and weeping. Why do you think they might have been crying and weeping? Any ideas? They recognize their sin. Recognize their sin? They were able to hear their law for the first time. And Hearing their law for the first time, good. Well, what, what happens in our lives when we really take time to think about what God's Word is saying? You know, does, it, does it quicken our hearts? Do we start recognizing how far short we fall of what God really wants from us? You know, does, it, does it cause us to weep and cry? But then the following in verses, you know, the, these guys are saying, hey, don't weep and cry. 
Instead, rejoice. You know, have a, you know, in, in Guatemala, we say, go have a fiesta. And because uh, we have great reason to celebrate as well. But what, what I really like about this passage is Ezra is reading the law. Now, you've got 50,000 people out there. And my, and my guess is he probably had more than 13 men. But he's got them scattered around in this crowd. And what are they doing as, as Ezra is reading the law? We have, verse 2, we have men, women, and all who could listen with understanding. And all the people were attentive. We see it again in verse, uh, verse 8. They read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give sense so that they understood the reading. So, we have a lot of people in this in this crowd, like we said this morning, there's that may be hearing God's word for the very first time. And possibly with the question of, okay, I'm hearing what this is saying. What does it mean? And they have these these guys scattered around in the crowd. I can see these little Bible studies going on while he's teaching where, where people are explaining basically giving interpretation to what's being taught. The end result is this entire crowd at the end is, is they understood and when they, when they understood their initial response was you know, a quickened heart and then rejoicing. You know, we have, you know, for us the story doesn't end here. We go on to the end of Old Testament and into the New Testament, and we have you know, all of the teachings of the New Testament. But what, is, what does God want us to do with his word? What does he want us to do with what he's been teaching us? You know, Carol, you know, you just said this, and, and, and we'll say it again. You know, what is God saying to us this morning? What is God saying to you when you study 2 Timothy? How are you going to apply it in your life? Who are you going to share it with? Or if we look at this, who are you going to share this word with and then help give them understanding? And, I, and as, we, as, as Carol talked in, about our ministry, I think that's, that's one of the areas where we see the church really not being terribly effective. We have evangelical churches all over Guatemala. But I think there's very few people that leave their churches on a, on a weekly basis that really understood what they've heard, have it affect, have it affect their own lives, and are in a position to share with somebody else. You know, that's why, why storytelling is, has become so much so attractive to us. Is you take short passages of scripture, understand it well, apply it in your life, Go share it with somebody else. And, and isn't, isn't that what 2 Timothy is all about? I mean, Paul's at the end of his life. He's, he's raised up Timothy. How many times do you see that idea of teaching sound doctrine? 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, one of our favorite verses. Go find like-minded like men that are going to go out and quit others. It doesn't, you know, God's word... And, the, and God's love for us doesn't end with me. It doesn't end with you. He wants us to communicate that to, uh, to other people. And it, it doesn't matter how long we've been walking with the Lord. It could be for decades or it could be for days. But every one of us is, is learning something about God's word. And we have a responsibility to apply it in our lives, but also share it with somebody else. And I think there's just tremendous wisdom here in Ezra's part to have these guys that had understanding, have them scattered around in this crowd to help them understand what they were hearing. You know, and, and we know the end of, of the story for us is there is going to be a great fiesta. You know, yes, 
We need, need to be touched by God's heart, by God's word. It, we need to be changing our lives. But it's, you know, through his Holy Spirit, through knowing him, through spending time in his word, that that's going to that's gonna happen. But we have a great reason to celebrate. Reason to celebrate. Number one, because you know, Christ died for us. That's a great story. But beyond that, one day he's going to come back for his church. He's going to take us up. There's going to be a great celebration. We had a pastor come down to Guatemala and was teaching on a Galilean wedding. On the day of the wedding ceremony, not the betrothal, but you know, about a year later, there was a big fiesta when the bridegroom goes for his bride, brings her to his, his father's house, and there is a huge fiesta. And uh, we have great cause to celebrate, especially that day that he comes for us. Uh, but people need to know that message. So uh, there's probably lots of other applications in this, uh, in this passage, but to me, it, it, it's, it's critical. We are, today, we are those ones who through good teaching and application, have understanding of God's word. And we have that responsibility to help others understand it. So let's pray. Father, thanks for, uh, for your word. Thank you that even uh, this time in, uh, in the history of, uh, of Judah and Israel, that uh, you laid on the heart of uh, Ezra to place people around who knew and understand your word and were there to help others understand it, apply it in their lives, and then encourage them to, uh, to share uh, what you were doing in their lives with others. I pray that you would uh, cause us to have the same uh, vision and focus uh, for ministry personally in each one of our lives. In Christ's name. Before you get too comfortable, though, for us, uh, let me just share a couple of things, but I'd, I'd love to just have an opportunity for uh, any of us who'd like to ask questions about the ministry, too. I know some of you would be able to stick around and, and visit with Forrest and Carol after the service. Um, but i also like to just give opportunity for those who can't, uh, we, since we have a little extra time, uh, just to feel free to ask them some questions. But let me just say a couple of things before I invite Forrest back up. Um, uh, if you would like to, uh, as we mentioned, we support service for him as a church. However, if you would like to uh, give something to the ministry, um, if you'd like to leave something in the box, as you know, we don't take an offering here, so don't feel obligated, but if you would like to give something to Service for Him directly uh, in your offering uh, today, um, you can just write in the memo, either Service for Him or S4H or something like that, uh, or you can make out the, the check itself to Service for Him, and uh, we'll make sure it gets to them, and uh, we'll be able to go ahead and use it for the ministry that they do. Um, there is more about their ministry, too, that, uh, that I'd certainly like to ask, and if you'd like to as well. Is Carol still here? Is she uh... Okay, all right. Well, uh, of course, if you wouldn't mind, if we just take a few more minutes of your time. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand, and uh, I'm glad to answer. Um, I would love to hear, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, we, while we support financially, my hope is that at some point, either this year or next, uh, we'll be able to actually send a team down to help out at Service Room down in Antigua. And so uh, I would love to hear more about what's involved in doing that kind of thing. Okay. But again, if any of you have questions beyond that, just raise your hand, and when we're kind of finished, I'll come up and we'll pray again, and y'all can visit with them in the back if you like. Um, I'll use an example. After, after Hurricane Stan uh, came through Guatemala in 2005, um, there was a huge need for relief, and one of the pastors that God connected us up with really has a heart for this community. It was, at that time, the food relief. But what has happened since then is, is we have gone back numerous times to do projects in, in his community. Some teaching, the one we most recently did in February was, uh, we finished on Valentine's Day, was building a house for a, a poor family. When, uh, when I go back in, uh, in April, we have another house for a widow that we're going to be uh, working on. Um, so that's, that's probably a very typical kind of project that, that we might work on if, uh, if a team came down. 
give us a sense of the environment that you're working in. How many people, what kind of an economy, what is the government oversight issues you deal with, what's the health care situation, what, what, are you, what are you working on? Uh, well, we, Antigua is a tourist town, so, so we that. have... What are you working on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Goth has pr primarily called us to work uh, up in the mountains uh, above where we live, and we would call it the highlands, um, with, uh, with the Mayans. Um, this pastor that I was mentioning, his, his heart language, it's called Sutu Heal. We have a Mayan couple that's part of the ministry. Their heart language is Quiche. There's 23 Mayan languages in Guatemala. Uh, generally, uh, poor uh, villages. Uh, a lot of people still living in adobe houses that are terribly unsafe because of not real stable in earthquakes. But they also get wet and moldy uh, during the rainy season. Um, but. The, the Mayas are the ones that we are primarily working with, which means we always typically have to have a translator from Spanish to whatever the Mayan language is, or from English to Spanish to the Mayan language. Um, average income in, in Guatemala is about a thousand Q a month, which is roughly between 125 and 150 dollars a month. 10, 10 Q a day, about a dollar, dollar and a quarter a day. It's not, it's not much. Don't do the math because it probably doesn't work. Um, but the, you know, again, I mean, the, it, it appears, it gives the appearance of being a churched culture. And they are. I, I've used the expression many times, we have as many churches as we have tiendas. There is a Tend to selling coke and chips and that kind of stuff on every other house. It seems like we have. It seems, seems like we have that many churches, but very few people have really been discipled. Um, healthcare. You know, we, we go to extremes. Guatemala is number three in uh, medical tourism. We have excellent hospitals and physicians if you have money. Now, it's a whole lot cheaper for us to do stuff there than it is here. Um, but if you're a normal person in Guatemala, there's public hospitals that do as little as possible for you. And so there's, there's a lot of pre pre preventable uh, diseases and problems or curable problems, but because of lack of finances, things are left and then problems uh, Problems get worse. Someone will go to the hospital. Hospital will tell them you need these medications after leaving the hospital. They don't give them to them. They're responsible for paying for them, and they don't have the funds to buy them. And so, nothing happens. Um, and so, so we talked about healthcare. We talked about a little bit about the culture, economy. Economy. Um, again, you go to Guatemala City. It looks like any major city in the world, but you get outside of the borders of uh, like Guatemala City, um, and, and it's poor. You know, it's, um, there's corruption. Uh, you know, Guatemala was uh, um, under a dictatorship for many years. It's called the Republic of Guatemala, uh, but it doesn't look too much different than here. Most politicians are there for their for their own gain and not and not there for the uh, the good of the people. Um, we have all kinds of laws in the books, most of them uh, ignored and uh, and not uh, and not enforced. And uh, and bribery works quite well. You know, if you get stopped by a policeman, usually it's it's for nothing that you've done wrong. It's because they want they want a bribe. The more Spanish you know, the better, because you, you might be able to talk yourself out of it. I was stopped a few weeks ago, and uh, this policeman said, I couldn't drive in the country with my Virginia driver's license. Um, and I said, no, I've been here for 10 years. This has never been an issue. Why is it an issue today? Well, this is law. So then I handed him my, my Guatemalan uh, residency card. And he said, are you a, are you a resident? 
I said, yes. I said, why didn't you tell me? I said, you didn't ask me. <laughs> he let me go, but you know, others would probably uh, pay, pay a fine. You know, on the spot, pay a fine. It probably doesn't make it back to the government. That's really fairly common. Um, something that happened with the culturally with all of Central and South America is when uh, the Spain, Portugal, the conquistadors came into uh, that part of the world. You know, they came with this mentality to, you know, conquer, rape, pillage. You know, basically they're taking anything they can get for their own. They also came with the with the Catholic Church, um, but there was this this class system that basically grew out of that. You know, these men basically were accountable to no one. You know, they had sex with the uh, Mayan women, started having families uh, that they really didn't care anything about, so they ignored them. A decade or so later. Spain said, okay, well, the country's now stable enough that your families that are back in Spain and Portugal, they can now come over. And so women came over with their, uh, with their kids only to find out that their husbands had started these other families. And they were in absolutely no position to do anything about it. Their only means of support was their, you know, conquistador husband had no means of supporting themselves and basically just had to live with it. And, and what, you know, we, we use the word here in the States, and, and as well as in Guatemala, machismo, this mentality of men can do no wrong, they're accountable to no one. But it started 500 years ago. And, you know, and again, that's one of those cultural problems that we see in the church. Why is it that the church has not been effective you know, and again, I'm saying Catholic Church, but the evangelical church has been in the country for a hundred years. And we, we describe the country as being religiously a mile wide and an inch deep. You know, again, it, it gives a surface impression that uh, it's a rich country. But you start examining individual lives, and uh, there's been no discipleship. It's not uncommon to have a pastor with multiple families. There are church leaders. There's a lot of rape, physical and, and verbal abuse. Um, abandonment is huge. Especially guys who think that they can go to the States, make a good income, with the idea of sending money back to the U.S. But frequently what happens is once they get to the U.S. and start earning some money, they seem to forget about their families in Guatemala. And so, you know, we have a biblical definition of a, of a widow in 1 Timothy, but culturally in the Mayan community, a widow includes these women who, who have been abandoned. Find, uh, find your ministry and email or effort by government at all, or are you pretty free to do Guatemala is pretty open. They're, they, they like people to come in and do stuff because then they don't have to. So, it, it's, uh, it's not like Venezuela. It's very, it's very easy to work in Guatemala. How about transportation back and forth? In countries and back in the States? We have airplanes. <laughs> we have an international airport. Um, uh, and most people, you know, you know we're fortunate because we, we have enough income to have a vehicle. Most people don't have vehicles. Um, have, have any of you ever worked with any anybody from a Latin culture in here? I know Barry has. Are they on time nor normally? <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> well, I, I mean, practically what happens is if you rely on public transportation, and it's not like public transportation here. You have all these little bus companies. Um, you have, again, laws that aren't enforced, but you frequently have uh, drivers who don't have driver's licenses. They, they drive way too fast. They don't maintain their vehicles. They frequently have accidents. 
if you happen to be on one of those buses and you don't die, you're probably not going to make it to where you're going on time. But you're, you're at the mercy of, of the, the system that, that they have. And so, you know, simple things like going to a doctor. We're used to make an appointment for here to, to see a doctor at a specific time, you know, and say, okay, well, this is my time. Of course, what happens here is just the opposite. You go to the doctor's office, you're, you're arrive in time, and you still have to wait for them. But there, they don't want to have to wait for patients who have scheduled an appointment to possibly show up. And so the doctors don't make appointments. You basically go during their office hours, and it's first come, first serve. Hard for a gringo who likes to schedule their time and have things planned out to 15-minute uh, intervals. By the way, if you send a mission team down, that is not going to happen. You might plan it that way, it won't happen. And you have a place you stay in there a period of time and you're not worried about that? We live there. Okay, you live there. We live there. So we're basically in, in the States roughly one month every year. Oh, okay. so, so we run a house there. And you work for different families? Yes. Um, it, you, you see a mix, in, in the Mayan culture, um, the Mayan women, even even young girls, will wear a, a, you know, a full-length skirt, seven yards of material, just a, a big wraparound skirt, a, um, a typically a hand-woven blouse called a, a wee peel, a uh, very conservative dress for the most part, but on the other side, in Guatemala City, a lot of uh, Western style clothes have come in. It's cheap. We have have these things called pockets, and, and people you know, from the states that come down. That there, there's bundles of clothes that come down, and you can buy uh, some nice stuff rel relatively inexpensively there. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, sex outside of marriage. It's very common to see, um, you know, a couple, you know, they're arms and legs wrapped around each other anywhere. I, again, it, I think it's part of that machismo culture. Somebody explained to me that the guys like to do that with the girls to basically publicly say to anybody who might be watching, hands off, she's mine. Um, uh, but unfortunately, there's also a lot of uh, rape that comes out of that. Uh, this, the same pastor that I was talking about that uh, we started working with in 2005, several years ago, their 15-year-old daughter was raped right in front of their house, um, <clears throat> and brutally. Um, when that case was brought before a judge, um, there was there were certainly consequences for for his actions, but the the family publicly forgave this young man, and he was practically thrown out of the community for doing so, because they they said that wasn't right. That they shouldn't have that. They, they shouldn't have forgiven this young man. And it's, it's it's just one of those it's one of those culture things. You know they don't understand that that whole idea of forgiveness. And and culturally, I mean it's it's basically an eye for an eye kind of culture in the minds. And, uh, and and so it's mixing that with God's word is is real difficult for them. And frequently they'll they'll lie more heavily. You know. God's word many times doesn't take uh, premacy over cultural practices. Does that answer your question? Uh, television, um, cell phones. We have we have cable TV. We have we have an internet connection. So are these wrapped around couples doing their business? Oh yeah, all the time. I was surprised when I went to Guatemala ten years ago. That, that even out in these remote areas, people have cell phones. But but what happens is the, the cell phone technology has grown rapidly, like it has here. But the telephone companies don't want to invest the funds to run cables into these in these small villages. And so the only means of real means of communication then is uh, is uh, by use of cell phones. And so. 
there's, there's, I think there's many more cell phones in Guatemala than we have here, I mean, per capita, than what we have here. And there's cell towers all over the place, so it's, it's a modern, relatively modern country in that, in that regard. And people do have televisions in their house. You know, they may not have other things, but they'll have a television in their house. Well, there are. I, again, you, you have those kinds of things in Guatemala City. We have big, beautiful malls and that kind of stuff. Uh, most the majority of the people probably have never seen those. Carol had had a, a young woman and her daughter uh, out in one of the villages a number of years ago, and this is a intelligent well-educated woman from Guatemala City, speaks English fluently, and they were out in this Mayan village, and, and she was trying to communicate with one of the ladies that Carol was, that was talking with, only to find out that this woman spoke very little Spanish. And to her surprise, and what she said to Carol was, she goes, I never knew that I had people in my own country that I can't communicate with. I mean, it was that, that whole, and, and you know, and, and I'm thinking, okay, well, there's 23 Mayan languages in this country, but it was just one of those things that she had never really realized that those, those huge cultural gaps between those who have money and those who don't, basically. Several things happened. During the Civil War that Carol talked about, um, because of the you know, brutality that was going on by the, by the Guatemalan military, a lot of Mayans were forced out of their villages and didn't have any place to go. And so they came into Guatemala City and Shalek and Quetzaltenango, some of the major cities, uh, looking for a place to live. And so you had this, this transplant of people coming into Guatemala City. Now, they live in very poor areas around the, around the city dump, uh, and, and with, really, with really no chance to, to advance. But, I mean, there's, there's a lot of Mayans that, that have shops right in Antigua where we live because they live in a relatively close proximity within a half an hour of, of, of Antigua. Uh, typically, where we work is hour, two hour, three hours out up in the mountains uh, from home. But uh, but they're they're certainly all over the country. But you know it's you know the tourist areas like Antigua, Guatemala City. You're you're going to see them. They're going they're all over the country. But you know the, the communities of Mayans are going to be outside of of the major cities. So are they considered a second class citizen? Or Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So starting to sense it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean you you, you basically have have three classes. You have the uh, the ones that are, are pure European background. Um, you have the, the mixed European and, and Mayans, and then you have the Mayans, and uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're treated like second class citizens. And, and, so, and so consequently, you know, they think that their cultural laws and practices in their communities override what the government tells them to do, and so there's, there's frequently those kinds of tensions. Where does income come from? Well, a lot of them, a lot of them don't have any income. Most most people will have a, a, a small house and a piece of land uh, that they farm. Uh, Mayans are called people of corn. They have a have a very interesting um, creation story, but basically, it's the gods created man out of corn, and so their their whole culture is very very much corn based. And so, if you have a piece of land. You would typically plant corn and then use that for making your tortillas. And they're not tamales, they're, they call them tamalitos. There's nothing inside of them, it's just, it's just steamed corn. Uh, but it's, it, <clears throat> I mean, there's, there's a saying in, in Mayan, in a, in a Mayan meal, the meal's not, uh, not finished if they don't have tortillas or tamalitos or, or something that's corn based. So there are a, lot, a lot of subsist basically subsistence kind of farming and very little income.
So when you're doing a, a field build or you're out, in, you know, with the in the community, if you will, and you're doing a rebuild and you've got a construction team down there, um, do you go out into that area and stay there for a week or two while you're doing this, and then what what kind of accommodations are offered for those that come down to work with you? What kind of accommodations would you like? <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer that, Barry. Um, it really does depend on where we're going to work. If um, we're going to be near Antigua, we would probably stay in a hotel or a boarding house within Antigua, within that area, and the accommodations are very nice. Uh, if we go up to Donatica Pond or out into the village, it's about four hours out, we would stay in a little, little less uh, wonderful accommodations. I mean, it'd be bunk beds or Whatever, but we probably cook our own meals uh, or kind of co-op that with the ladies there would help. Um, typically, there's going to be showers, but so we're very, very considerate of that. We do the best we can do. Transportation, we generally uh, will rent vans. Uh, we have drivers that stay with the teams, so you're not on a chicken bus, you know, with a bunch of other people jockeying for a seat or riding on the bumper. Uh, you'll be in a, in a nicer, newer, safer van with a driver who knows the area, will take us to and from projects, and back to either to the city or back to our lodge. And um, typically, depending on how many Spanish speakers we have with us, we'll have an appropriate amount of translators, and uh, we will make sure that everybody's uh, you know fed and safe and taken care of as best we can do, and uh, covered up with prayer. And, and tools and so on, uh, we have, and materials? Uh, we have all the tools pretty much that you would need to do whatever we do. Uh, people have you know, graciously brought stuff in the past and left them. So we have a, a huge uh, pile of masonry tools, like tools, carpet tools. So we're, we're pretty well set up. If the team was to come down and build, you'd probably want to bring your own tape measure, of course, some gloves and goggles, uh, some good work shoes, that type of thing. But we can pretty much provide everything you're going to need. What we would do is if the team's coming down and we know a specific task that you're coming for, and they may be saying, well, we really could use some this something or whatever that's available in the States, we would let you know in advance and provide you with either double bag or some way to bring that down. Typically what we do is we ask the teams to bring supplies that we would need and leave them and then uh, try to make, manage your own packet, your own resources in a carry-on that you could live out of. And then we call you mules. You know, see if you can just bring 50 to 100 pounds of stuff as your chuck luggage for the things that we would need for the ministry. And, and um, as far as bringing those things into the country, what kind of restrictions are there for that type Good of material question. import? Good question. Um, if it's medical supplies, it's very difficult to get in. We have a medical team coming in. Um, for some reason, the Guatemalan government has decided that that's just something that they want to know about. So. What we tend to, tend to bring in is stuff that's going to be closed, uh, tools, supplies, personal needs for the ministry, things like that, and we'll spread it out through a couple of duffel bags. If you have a team of, of say, eight people, you could literally carry 800 pounds of goods down for us. So depending on our needs at that time, we determine what that would be. Um, when we have, like, if you bring, like, 800 pounds of clothes, that's going to kick up a little surprise with the customers. They get a little frantic. You end up looking like a vendor. Um, so we tend to have a, a process of packing things to spread it out, make it look more like personal goods in a bag. So it really does depend on what it is. And again, it, a lot of these are variables. Depends on the team what you're going to be doing, what we would ask you to bring with you, and uh, we would certainly coordinate with you in advance to make sure that there wouldn't be any problems. As far as in the airport, um, I can put your best Spanish speaker forward in the line, and um, you can just pray for grace. <laughs> well, we've never had anything confiscated. I mean, we've even brought in medical supplies, and it's not been a problem. So, but you know, it's like any other country; they don't want you to think that you're importing stuff without the excise tax on it. So. Yeah, Juan and Celestina is a, a Mayan couple who who work with us. They, they live three hours from from uh, from our house. In uh, 2011 and 2012, we we built an addition onto their house. Um, but basically, two two dorm rooms, and Barry Barry came up with a unique design for basically a, a Murphy. You know what a Murphy bed is? Mm. Mur Murphy bunk beds. You know, so we basically have have two on top of each other, and they swing up horizontally rather than, than vertically. 
And, uh, and so we have two rooms with, with Murphy beds in it. So we, we have space for, for 11 people uh, as a result of doing that. I've been sitting on top of that as a classroom. Yeah, beds for 11 people. Beds for 11 people. Space for more. Space for more. But, you know, but many times, I, 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 before I had that, when I'd go up and work at Juan's house, I'd just take a cot with me and sleep on a cot. I want to preface my question with this. Uh, in China, for instance, which is essentially a forced, godless nation, right. there's a huge, huge growing middle class. Wages going up, big, big, big cities and so on. Now, if you juxtapose that, and I don't want this to offend anybody, it might sound like this, but if you juxtapose that situation, say, in China, that basically has no church, of course, there's an underground Christian church, is the problem in a lot of these Latin countries, the cultures, is the problem with corruption and all the problems that exist, basically, that it be laid at the, at the feet of the Catholic Church. Um, because the Catholic Church traditionally has been hugely corrupt. And, and, and a lot of these cultures are, are Catholic based, if there's any. I, I, I'm, the, the simple answer to the question is yes. But, you know, again, evangelicals have been in, in Guatemala for more than 100 years. Well, let me, you know, let, me, let me say I mean, this. How, how, how long can we blame George Bush? <laughs> I'm not, I don't really mean it that way. No, no, but, but basically, yeah. I mean, as an American, why, why, even with the problems we have, or Western Europeans have, I mean, our cultural problems and all the problems we have, why do things, in terms of enterprise, economics, why do things work in America? Why do they work in Western Europe? And they never seem to work in other cultures. Well, it, it's... And, and I know that's a broad-based question, but to me, it seems like a very legitimate question. Well, if you, if you think about the, the history of the U.S., when, when people started coming over here from Europe, you know, what we learned in, in history classes was, you know, people were coming over here initially for religious freedom. They didn't like the having only the Church of England, for example, and they wanted to come over here and have be free to, to, to worship God the way they wanted to. But the but the whole foundation of the U.S. was based upon, you know, enterprising people and people coming here for for freedoms sake and, and, and religious reasons in but in the in the mind you know in the outside of the u.s you have you know again these, these conquistadors coming in basically spain portugal other countries sending people out to come over for the gold to take whatever they can get but what resulted from that was you know at at the high level you know a king that was, you know, as they were claiming territory, saying, okay, well, you know, this is a Spanish nation, you know, this is a Portuguese nation, whatever. But you, you ended up, as time went on with, um, you know, either this royal, you know, monarchy or eventually dictatorships in these countries. And so after revolutions and they, they're, they're freed from Spain and, and whatever, and they, they, and they try to establish a democratic form of, of government, it's extremely difficult to make that transition because the corruption has been there from the very beginning. And those with money and power want to stay in power and don't want to give it up. The, what, uh, one of the things that caused the uh, the civil war that we had in Guatemala was centered around land that had been taken, acquired from by from the Mayans, from from the from the from the culture, um, legally, illegal, legally by, by cheating, whatever. And then there was this push for land reform. There was 
you know, leaders who wanted to get the land back into the hands of the, the, the real owners of the property, it was seen as a, um, and taken advantage of by uh, socialists and communists, using it as, as, a, as, a, as a, a point of, a rallying point, you know, for the, for the Mayans. And so you've got this, again, this, this cultural conflict between those who have money and power and those who don't. And so uh, years ago, we had, we had a friend that their, their whole work was, was oriented, oriented around helping countries go from a dictatorship to democracies. And it takes decades, you know, if not centuries for it to happen because those who have the money and power never want to give it up. And, and you know, I, mean, we fre I frequently ask this question, is, is, I, is there any way to, uh, to overcome this? I mean, the simple answer is yes. You know, God can do anything. But, but practically, you see, those who, those who have control don't want to release it. Well, I, that, that would go without saying. If you know anything about human nature. Right. So is, other than, missionary work like you do is the answer to my question basically in countries in, in these kind of countries now what one thing I hear you saying is that it essentially has to be the very native people there people that are born there it has to be if there's going to be a revolution or a change it's got to be the people themselves Right. It has to be. Is, would that be an incorrect statement? Because, I mean, what I'm asking, in a way, as a Christian, can you be a missionary if, like you do, and you go down to minister to a specific need, and basically you just say, there's not one heck of a thing I can do about the rest of this misery, but I can go do what I've gone to do. I mean, I think about it in terms of are these countries doomed to be this way forever? Or can the very people themselves change their own country? Well, in other words, is yeah. there, of course in Christ Jesus there's hope for everything. Right. But uh, uh, surely you understand what I'm asking. I, I mean, I if do. you're 62 years old and you've been a Catholic <laughs> uh, all, most of your life, you know what I'm asking. Right. No, I, 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 fre I frequently have that discussion with people saying, if, if you know, just simply, if, if, if you as a, as, a, as a native Guatemalan were going to address one problem in this country and try to make that work correctly, what would you do? And they usually don't have an answer. I mean, it's... Generally, I think that the problems that they see there are just being, being overwhelming. But, you know, the hope that we have, is, like you said, is, you know, is, you know, that lives are transformed not by, you know, just some, some, someday saying, okay, I'm going to be a responsible citizen. Lives are transformed because, because God is, is changing our hearts. And, and so, you know, our hope is that as we work with pastors, and cultures and, 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 and get pastors to be teaching clearly and, and solidly God's word and really talking about the application of it in every aspect of a person's life that, that we're going to start seeing those kinds of transformations. But it's, you know, we've had this discussion numerous, time, numerous times within our ministry. Discipleship is is not a real glamorous, um, it's, not a, it's not the kind of a ministry that has a lot of visibility because things don't happen quickly. It takes time. Christ spent, you know, three years with 12 guys, you know, preparing them to start churches. And, uh, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't hundreds, you know, and thousands of people that he was focusing his attention on it was primarily those 12. Now we see 120 in the upper room at Pentecost, but still a relatively small number of people 
you know, when he physically left the earth, uh, that were those who were responsible for reaching the world. You know, and, and you know, here we are 2,000 years later, and uh, we're still trying to do that. Of course, the, with regard to your time in the States, uh, you're here about a month out of the year, is that about right? And, and do you come here then to speak to a number of churches? Do you travel around the South, or how, how, do, you, how do you do that and appropriate your time when you are in the States, and what is your focus there, and, and how many churches are involved now in your support group? Um, about. <laughs> I think we've got we've got six churches on the east coast and uh, and, and uh, two or three churches out on the west coast. Okay. You know, Carol, Carol and I have this wonderful idea that again, you know, kind of being saved in a, in a missions-minded church. What we, we saw when missionaries came home from the states is, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a restful time. They spend all their time running around all over the country trying to visit all their supporting churches and supporting families and touching base with them. And so we said, okay, what we're going to do is we're just going to focus all, all of our support raising effort in Northern Virginia because we came from the same area that Barry and Marquita live in. And, uh, you know, and of course, God had a different plan. And so we you know, have a church up in northeastern, northwestern Pennsylvania, four in, in Loudoun County. You guys are down here. Uh, church out in... Uh, Two churches out in Southern California started supporting us. We're going, okay, what happened to that plan? Yeah, was, that was our plan. It wasn't God's plan. Um, yeah, we we spent an awful lot of time on the road. Um, you know, Barry, uh, Barry and Marquita have done a very good job of filling up our uh, our calendars for this trip. Um, now, now this year, Carol's Carol's mother is turning ninety this year, and uh, so she wants to celebrate her her birthday with Carol. So they're going to go on this this nice cruise, and they didn't invite me. <laughs> but uh, but we will actually celebrate her birthday out in uh, in California in June. So I'll go back to Southern California uh, in June and connect connect with the churches out there. But normally, we, since the majority of our uh, support base comes from uh, from the East Coast, you guys would be considered East Coast, east of the Mississippi. <laughs> um, you know, we spend most of our time uh, here, but uh, it's it's not a relaxing time typically. So we, we do spend a lot of time running around. We have uh, we have a son who lives in, in Leesburg, again, up by, by Barry Marquita. We have another son in Minnesota um, with two grandkids there, a daughter that lives just south of Raleigh, North Carolina, and they've got uh, four kids. But our other daughter lives in England. And like Carol said, we've seen her once in, in the last 10 years. Yeah, a screaming baby is reminding me that we should probably end this now. But uh, uh, I want to thank you guys for sharing with us this morning, and uh, Taurus will be at, back by their table, we've uh, come on our book table today to uh, give them an opportunity to put out some, uh, some things that can help you understand more about their ministry and that kind of thing. Uh, Barry and Keita are, are, are loving every minute they have with their grandbaby, but you might be able to sneak a question into them while they're here, too. So uh, if you want to stick around and, and, uh, and bend their ear a little bit more, they'll be here with us this morning. And, uh, but why don't we go ahead and stand and close for now, and, uh, and uh, as we close the prayer, we'll close a little bit uh, uh, this ministry as well. So, Father, we want to thank you for our time here this morning. We thank you, Lord, because it reminds us, uh, in the time we've spent here, it reminds us that the view that you have of the work that you're doing extends far beyond our four walls, but goes even, uh, as Carol said earlier, to the, uh, the farthest ends of the earth. And we thank you, Lord, for just the ministry of service for him and what you're doing in Antigua right now. And pray that, Father, the equipping that you are allowing them to participate in and the lives that are ultimately being changed because of it would find uh, find themselves multiplying throughout their communities. We thank you, Lord, that uh, even when Jesus stood on trial, you know, he made the comment that his kingdom is not of this world. And so we do look forward to the, the coming kingdom where we'll be able to stay in your presence, Lord, standing before you when you have wrong, when you've righted all the wrongs, when you set things straight. In the meantime, Father, Father, I pray that you would help each one of us to whatever place you've called us to turn that part of the world upside down to Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit that resides in each one of us, and I pray that he would have the freedom in our lives to do great things for your name's sake. We pray that, Father, you'd have your hand upon Forrest and Carol, Barry and Keaton, and all of those who are serving in that ministry, both here and there, and that, Father, you bring great fruit for your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of coming alongside, but thank you most of all, Father, 
for those who find their hands getting dirty in that work day after day. I pray that you bring them refreshment, additional strength, uh, everything that they need. And I pray that, Father, most of all, in the midst of all that you provide for them, you provide clear directions they continue down the road you've called them. Thank you, Father. I just pray that, God, you go before us this day and just guide our steps, that we also might serve you with our lives. We thank you, we praise you, we bless you. And, Father, if there are any in this place right now or who may hear this message later on the podcast or whatever, who've never made peace with God, we talk about mission and reaching out, but, Father, there are many unsaved people right here within the sound of our own voices oftentimes. And we pray that, Lord, you would speak to their hearts even right now, that we have heard these words that Forrest was sharing this morning and realize that they want to know this God that we've been talking about. So, Father, if they are within your shot even right now, I pray that you bring their hearts to that place of confession and desire to know you and be forgiven. If that is you, I want to give you an opportunity right now to ask the Lord to forgive you. He's willing and ready and able. If anyone confesses their sins, he's faithful and just to forgive those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you, Lord, that you will make us new creations in Christ if we'll then come. So if you're in this place or you're within the sound of my voice and you have never come to that place of confession before the Lord, I want to give you that opportunity by sharing a very simple prayer that you might respond and even come to know the Lord right now, right where you are. So just repeat after me this very simple prayer. Heavenly Father, I realize that I am a sinner. I've broken your law. I've offended you and others. And I've walked far away from you even being the Lord of my own life. But I want to change. And I can only change if I give myself to you, who will then change me. So I confess my sins to you. I believe that Jesus died for every one of my sins on that cross. And that by putting my faith in him, I can be forgiven and I can be free. I believe in him, and I want to walk with him, leaving behind my old life and walking in newness of life by the power of your Holy Spirit. Save me, Father, and give me the strength to follow you for the rest of my days until I see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you're in this place, I invite you to stick around with me, just talk to you, pray with you, give you a Bible, help you learn how to walk with Him. Because, of course, I mentioned a number of times, discipleship is key to learning how to walk with the Lord, and real devoted, intentional desire to walk with Him. So, please stick around. The rest of you, I pray you have a, a great and safe week. I think it's supposed to start freezing some of this rain a little later. Uh, we'll put our closing song right a little longer right now, but I invite you again to stick around and be with Forrest and Carol and Barry and Keita and such if you can. Otherwise, have a great week. God bless you. Thank mm -hmm. you.